Uh, just a, a quick introduction because many of you already know Van Jones very well, so this is really short. Yale Law School graduate, former Green Jobs Advisor to the Obama White House, co-founder of numerous progressive nonprofit organizations, a husband and a father, and he is here today to talk about Rebuild the Dream, that platform, as outlined in his new book. Here, here's the advertisement. <laughs> anyway, please welcome Van Jones. Thanks. Um, so you got, they're kind of lopsided on this side, so I, I, might, I might favor this side a little bit more, no offense. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad to be here. It's, um, this is the first talk I've given on the book. Um, I've been on TV, but you, you know, it's really short, so I'm going to get a chance to talk for a little bit longer. Um, I also want to acknowledge that my colleagues are here. The name of the book is Rebuild the Dream, but also the name of the organization is Rebuild the Dream. And I want to just give a round of applause to uh, Natalie Foster, uh, Jim Pugh, and Tyler, who's taking my picture right now. So you guys just, just turn around. <laughs> so so um, since it was such a short introduction, which I kind of appreciate, uh, <laughs> But I was, <laughs> exactly, that was good. Um, for people who may have missed some episodes in the Van Jones sitcom, uh, I used to be a grassroots outsider uh, in the Bay Area. And I used to work with uh, low-income kids, uh, kids of color. My job was trying to get kids out of jail and into jobs. And discovered that there was a big wave of jobs coming in the green sector, in the clean, in the clean tech sector. And so I came up with this great slogan, green jobs, not jails, you see, uh, which I thought was genius. And uh, it wound up turning my life completely upside down because it turns out that point in time, if you went into Oakland and you talked about green jobs, they would say, I'm for that. You mean jobs with money? I'm like, no. And so big education on that side. And then on the clean tech side, they were for the green. They didn't understand the connection between the jails thing. So wound up being a really tough thing to sort through. But we were able to achieve something in Oakland. And it was called the Green Jobs Corps. And we got the Oakland City Council in 2007 to uh, pass, uh, uh, I guess, a, a piece of, of local legislation that let a lot of young kids in the community get trained to put up solar panels and to weatherize homes. And so uh, it was a huge uh, light bulb moment for a lot of people. And there was a woman named Nancy Pelosi, who at the time, when we first started, uh, was just getting underway as Speaker of the House. And she, she took me and my friends to Washington, DC. And we got this guy named George W. Bush, uh, you may have heard of, uh, to sign into law something called the Green Jobs Act to make that possible all across the country. And I wrote a book, and it came out. It was called The Green Collar Economy, also on sale. <laughs> and um, a guy named Barack Obama read it, and I went up going to the White House uh, to help implement some of these programs. It was the best six months of my life, followed by the worst two weeks of my life. Uh, so if you, you, can, you can Google and find out about that if you don't know about it. But I then took some time off. I, I taught at Princeton for a year, and I tried to kind of make sense of what I had observed. And having been a, a grassroots outsider, and then having become a, a White House insider, and then being out, an outsider again, I kind of had this 360 degree view of some of the ways that people who have ideas and values like mine were just missing each other, and missing opportunities to make a, a, a bigger difference and a better impact. And so I wanted to write both a book to express ideas, but also to try and do something about it. For me, and I, again, before I went to work for the administration, I could sort of uh, kind of have a more nonpartisan pose. I kind of have to confess, you know, I, uh, I, I'm on the left. This may shock some of you. But, <laughs> um, and from that perspective, uh, I remember 2008. And I remember November 2008. And I remember how that felt. Uh, my father had just passed away uh, a few months before. Um, he'd grown up uh, poor in the segregated South. Uh, he had to fight just to be able to get any job. He was finally able to get a job uh, in the school system after 
lawsuits, and then he was able to become a, a principal of a small junior high school. And he had grown up in poverty. He got himself out of poverty. He put himself through college. He put his little brother through college. He put his cousin through college. He put me through college. He put my sister through college. He was kind of this original bootstrapper. And then he spent the rest of his life trying to get other kids out of poverty. And his view, uh, at the end of his life, was that kids trying to get out of poverty and into the middle class had to climb that ladder themselves. You can't give them anything that would stop a child from being poor. You give them money, but if they're poor in their heart or poor in their mind or poor in their spirit, uh, you'll stop them from being broke, but they'll be broke again. To get out of poverty, you've got to climb that ladder yourself. I saw that myself in Oakland. But he also had a view, which is my view, which is that even though that child has a responsibility to climb that ladder, him or herself, grown folks have a responsibility too. Society has a responsibility too, to make sure that each child has a ladder to climb. And that's my basic view, and that's the view in this book, that yes, I'm all for individual responsibility. I'm a dad now. I'm a lot more for it now than I was when I was younger. <laughs> um, anybody, anybody here got any children? OK, so. Uh, Chores have a totally different meaning when you're a parent. <laughs> it's good for you. <laughs> um, but when I was a kid, I hated it. My only point is simply this. I think that the ladder's falling over. The ladder's falling over. And if we're going to be able to be a middle class country, uh, if the next generation of people like my dad are going to be able to get out of poverty into the middle class, and frankly, if people who are in the middle class right now are going to be saved from falling over into poverty, we're going to have to do a lot of things differently. And one of the things we're going to have to do is to take a real assessment of what happened to that movement for hope and change. What happened? Uh, November 2008, uh, people were crying in the streets, uh, hugging uh, strangers in New York. I mean, that's weird. <laughs> um, it wasn't just a partisan thing. It wasn't just Democrats that liked that. There were people on all political uh, sides of the political spectrum and divide felt moved. They thought something important had happened or shifted in the country. And that, that it seemed like something was possible there. And yet within a year, not only were we back to the same kind of fighting, and it, was, it felt worse. And I think that a lot of people went from hope to heartbreak pretty fast. And I think a lot of us have been just kind of confused since then. Uh, I think a lot of us looking at this election coming forward have some confusion. Um, I call it the, you know, the post-hope Democrats, the post-hope independents. Probably like this president, probably not as in love with him as people were in uh, 2008. Uh, probably like a lot of what the folks in the Occupy movement were saying back in the fall, but don't want to go get pepper sprayed. So <laughs> what are we supposed to do? And the book is really aimed toward the post-hope Democrats and progressives and independents who are trying to figure out how we make sense of what just happened and how we, we go forward. My big insight uh, that I uh, try to share in the book is I think the White House had the wrong view of the grassroots. I think they had the wrong theory of the grassroots. And I think the grassroots had the wrong theory of the presidency. And those two fundamental pieces of misunderstanding created, I think, a lot of missed opportunities. So on the one hand, I think that there was a tendency, not for everybody at the, at the national level, but there certainly was a tendency uh, for some of the DC uh, Democrats to think about the grassroots progressive movements um, almost sort of like something that could be pulled out of the refrigerator, microwaved up, and you know, encouraged to take action, but then put back in the refrigerator without a real sense that these are kind of living, mo living movements often and that the movements themselves really predated Obama's run. In fact, I make the claim in the book that the movement for hope and change did not start with Barack Obama. That Barack Obama was, was not the author or the creator of the movement for hope and change. And that in fact, you can see the precursors all the way back in 2003 with the rise of the concern about the war uh, in Iraq and that you begin to see this sort of multiracial, people-powered, technog technologically enabled movement starting to form uh, that had higher hopes for the country and wanted change all the way back to 2003. 
and you had groups like moveon.org that were tapping into that. Uh, there was no one leader. There was no superstar, celebrity, savior that was going to fix everything. In fact, it, that was the beauty of it, that it was completely disaggregated. And yet, the New York Times called it the world's second superpower, that movement, those millions of people who were marching against the war. We've almost forgotten that history, but that was really the start of something important. That poured right over in 2004 with Howard Dean. Uh, 2005, we had Katrina, uh, which broke people's hearts across the country. By 2006, this movement was strong enough that we elected Pelosi to be the Speaker of the House. Now, mind you, 2004, Karl Rove said, the Republicans are going to run the House and run the, the Congress for 20 or 30 years. This movement held them to 24 months. By, by the time you get from 2004 to 2006, there's been a complete flip over. All this is before Obama runs. Uh, mainstreamed concern about the war before Obama ran. Al Gore came out. Mainstream concern about climate and energy before Obama ran. So there was a big movement happening in the country. And that movement luckily met this man uh, who needed a movement, and the movement, frankly, needed someone to articulate the concerns that were beginning to rise up in the, in the people. And luckily, somebody like Obama came along, because he took this movement to a place and a level that nobody I know was, was even thinking was possible and made history. And when the man and the movement met, it just created this global supernova. But I think sometimes we forget, as inspiring as Obama was at that time and, and, and often is now, we the people inspired him first. That's the most important thing I can say. It was, it, people inspired him first. He, was, he said he had no plans to run for president in 2004, 2005. And yet something was evoked in him. He said, this is the time. Which means if there is a hope gap in America, you can't just point at Obama. You can't just blog about Obama. You know, we have this whole phenomenon now where people, it's like, you know, I, call it, I call it, if only the president would read my blog, <laughs> all would be well, right? You know, and it's just this kind of phenomenon where, like, for at least the past two or three years, most progressives have been in this whole kind of debate with Obama in their brain, forgetting that we were doing stuff before Obama was around. In fact, we were doing a lot of great stuff. In fact, it was because we were so active and so passionate that we created the space for someone like, well, someone like him to run and to win. So on the one hand, I think that there might have been a failure to understand the grassroots of, by some of the folks in Washington, DC. But I think also a failure for us to understand ourselves. And that became this strange projection with regard to Obama. We began to almost expect him to be a social movement leader and not head of state. And I think that's a very fundamental misreading of American history. You, the, think about the most liberal president ever, right? Not Nixon. Uh, <laughs> though he did pass a lot of cool stuff that I'm going to talk about. But LBJ, right? I think we would all have to agree that LBJ is probably the most liberal president. You know, the war on poverty, I mean, not on the war, fine, but war on poverty, <laughs> the other war. <laughs> um, uh, civil rights stuff passed, signed like two big civil rights bills probably the high point of American liberalism. Did LBJ lead the civil rights movement? You guys must have taken some history classes at some point. I know you're at Google. <laughs> right. No, not, not, not at all. In fact, there was a vigorous civil rights movement in the streets, grassroots people, and there was a head of state, LBJ. LBJ was willing to listen to and respond favorably to the movement, but there had to be a movement to do the moving. And I think what happened to some of us was, Obama kind of looks like a social movement leader. I mean, I think he's cute. <laughs> he talks good. Um, you know? And I think there's this thing, well, this is, our, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is MLK, and he's president, right? <laughs> How cool is that? And so you kind of sit and you kind of wait for him to do what a social movement leader would do, which is to go and challenge the, this consensus and disrupt everything and stick up for the, but that's not what any US president has done. LBJ didn't lead the civil rights movement. The people had to do that. FDR didn't lead the labor strikes that led to the New Deal. We the people did that. Lincoln wasn't even an abolitionist. Uh, that was uh, the, you know, Frederick Douglass and John Brown, a bunch of other people. Uh, Nixon, you thought I was just making it funny, but Nixon, 
famously didn't lead the environmental movement, but he signed into law the EPA, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. Right? So you can have an arguably crappy president, but if you have a strong enough movement, the environmental movement, you can actually get a lot of good things done. So really, we thought we had all we needed when we got to Washington, D.C. We had the House with Nancy Pelosi, best speaker ever. We had 60 votes in the Senate, and we had Barack Obama as president. We thought we had all we needed. It turned out that's one third. That's the big takeaway. That's only a third of what you need. You also have to have popular movements. Uh, the Tea Party was out there as a popular movement. They had a big impact, even though they didn't have governmental control. And you have to have big media uh, uh, coordination. Fox and, and the right-wing bloggers played a huge role in impacting policy, even though they had none of those levers of power. Uh, I would argue, as a progressive, that under Bush, we had the right movement for peace, but the wrong president. And as a progressive, I would say, under Obama, we had the right president, but the wrong movement, the Tea Party. So my hope is that going forward, we can both have the right president and the right movement. That's what I want to do. That's what the book is about. Can you have the right president who's willing to be moved by the people, but can you also have a movement willing to do the moving? And I think that it's possible. And I'll tell you why I think it's possible. I think there's a level of economic pain in the country that is historic. You guys probably have people in your families, cousins, people you went to school with. They're not living the lives they expected to live. They are, it, it, they, they, we have people who, if you think about a lot of the young people who are graduating now off a cliff, into the worst economy since the Great Depression, with massive debt and no jobs. That is, a, that is a, a relatively new, and I mean people who went to good schools who are struggling. That is a relatively new development in our country. Uh, you think about the young veterans who are coming home uh, to very little hope, uh, many of them with a lot of uh, psychological and physical scars. Um, when they were overseas, they got a chance to get a lot of support. Uh, they did some nation building over there. Uh, you know, Halliburton took too big of a cut out of it from my point of view, but there they are in another country. We dump them off at the hometown airport now with very little support. And they go from a military battleground with a lot of support to an economic battleground with very little support, and the suicides are starting to be bigger than the casualties of war. Now, my dad's generation already went through that. I think we should eliminate the term homeless veteran from the English language. That, that just shouldn't be happening, but it's happening. You look at the, the homeowners. America, we got a quarter of American homes are underwater right now in terms of financially. 11 million homes. People are spending more money on the home than the home is worth because the home got evaluated during that fantasy bubble period. And so you have people, uh, think about this. this. This is the American dream upside down, inside out. Used to be if you were a poor person, like my dad, how do you get out of poverty and into the middle class? You go to college, you buy a home, you're safe. That used to be the pathway out of poverty into the middle class. Not anymore. Now that can be the, the, the trap door from the middle class into poverty. Because you graduate with all this debt, but you don't have a job. And the house you got may not be worth what the bank told, told you it was worth. And so you got to make a choice. Do you, do, you, do you walk away? Do you keep bleeding yourself dry? To, these are the kinds of problems that are new for the country. But when you have problems that big, then sol big solutions make sense. And what I'm hoping to do with this Rebuild the Dream idea is to begin to talk about solutions at the scale of the problem. There's only a couple of ways you get to have a middle class in your country. And it's the middle class right now that's coming under fire. Used to be if you do economic justice work, you're just trying to get poor people into poverty. Now, you got to try and, get poor, get, try and get, get poor people out of poverty in the middle class. Now, you got to try to keep the middle class from falling over into poverty. That's a totally different fight. Um, and it's not a fight for which we're prepared uh, as a country. We haven't thought this all the way through. But you can, you can begin to propose solutions at the scale of the problem 
if you recognize there's only a couple of ways you're going to have a middle class in, the, in your country. You're either going to have high skilled manufacturing jobs or you're going to have a big knowledge economy, right? Well, we've already given away a lot of our manufacturing jobs. So the only real option for people in a certain age group, since you can't go get a decent job at the factory anymore, is to try to go to college and try to become, you know, get a job here with you guys. That would be a great outcome. <laughs> when I was, I was born in 68, for, for us it was, you know, uh, is your kid going to go to law school? That was like the big deal. Uh, you guys, you know, you probably eat lawyers for lunch. You're like, what lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not, not that big a deal. Come work at Google, that's a big deal. So, but how do you get here? Uh, somewhere along the way, if it didn't happen at your house, somebody had to have some program, some computer summer camp thing, something had to happen where people got a chance to get connected to these jobs of the future. The problem is we're the only country in the world for this next generation that's both sending away the manufacturing jobs, and making it harder for people to get educated and go to college because of the incredible high cost of college and the big debt you got to take on. That's not just bad for kids. It's bad for the country. How do you maintain a middle class country when you have a whole generation you're just going to throw overboard into the global marketplace with very little help? I don't know how America gets to compete in the world that way. So it's not just, oh, you know, why should I care about somebody else's kid? When, when I went to college, I paid off my own debt. I had several hundred dollars of debt. <laughs> I paid it off myself. <laughs> I mean, you hear this, you know? Um, and then it's kind of like this, this failure to understand that, you know, we're talking about $25,000, $50,000 in debt for, just for a BS or a BA. It costs more money now to go to UC Berkeley than it costs to go to Harvard. Why is that? It's because we used to think that educating a generation was good for the country, it's good for all of us. And now we think, it's well, maybe it's good for you, you and your kid. Good luck. It's a fast glide path down to a third-rate third status for a country if you do that. So we think it's an opportunity uh, to try to become a nation of neighbors again. That American dream, which is very easy to make fun of if you already got it, and if you're kind of on the cosmopolitan coast of the country, or some of those like blue dot college towns, very easy to poo-poo. That's just consumerism, commercialism, maybe. That's not all it is. It's not the best part of it. You know, the first thing Dr. King said about his dream, he said, I have a dream. It's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. He wasn't talking about commercialism. He wasn't talking about consumerism. He was talking about living in a country where everybody counts, where everybody's dreams matter. You shouldn't have to be born rich or have parents with a famous last name, to be able to work hard and get somewhere, to be able to work hard and get somewhere and give your kids something better than what you got. People have come here from all around the world, all around the world, just to try to get a little piece of that promise. And you know, my family, we're African American, we didn't choose to come here, but we chose to stay because of the beauty of that promise. And I don't think we should just let it be thrown overboard uh, because some folks don't want to pay their taxes or because we've decided that we can just all go on our individual routes. We're still one country, and we're going to rise or fall together. We're going to turn to each other or on each other, to each other or on each other. And our hope is that we can find some common ground now because the pain, and we'll have this nonsense for you know, until November. It's just the way D.C. works. But my hope is, my hopes depend on December. I think in December we have a chance to stand together again and look in the eyes of these young people. They're in red states and blue states. They're liberals, they're conservatives. Uh, they're people of faith, they're people of no faith. Uh, 
Some of them liked uh, Game of Thrones, some like Avatar. I mean, they, oh, they, you've met these people. Uh, and they deserve a shot. They deserve a shot. And I would reject any idea now that says you're a great patriot if you say, I just believe in liberty, individual liberty, good luck to you. If there's no other value in America that's worth defending than just individual economic liberty for you. I believe in liberty and justice for all. It's a different way of looking at the country. Yes, liberty. Yes, economic liberty. Yes, markets. Yes, the opportunity to excel. But if all you have is that, you don't have a country. If that's all you've got, you don't have a country. Okay. We learned in the last century, I'll say in conclusion, that if you just care about justice and you don't care about liberty, you get totalitarianism. That's the big lesson of the last century. In the name of justice, we're going to obliterate people's economic freedom, their individual liberty, in the name of justice, in which you got totalitarianism. That was the big lesson of the last century. Justice without liberty is totalitarianism. In this century, we got to learn a different lesson. Keep that one and learn something more. If all you've got is individual economic liberty and no justice, no concern about justice for all, no concern about the community, no concern about the next generation, no concern about your neighbor, you wind up with a different kind of tyranny. You wind up with a kind of not excess concentration of political power, but an excess concentration of economic power, and a lot of people left behind, good people, who have dreams and whose, ho whose hopes matter. So the book is an attempt to try to bring us back together, uh, throw a couple of punches at some ideas I don't like, but also hopefully to be able to put that ladder back up so we can keep the climb going toward a country with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Questions? Hi. <clears throat> it's, um, it's amazing to see you speak here. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you can tell me why you think college is so expensive today compared to in the past. Well, it's two things. The cost of education is not significantly higher. It's the price of education for the individual young person. There's something, something has gotten out of alignment. Part of it is when the, the, the private schools are a different conversation, but I'm mainly concerned about the public schools, schools like UC Berkeley that now cost more than Harvard. Um, it used to be the case that, again, we thought that it was good for society to have all these kids educated, and so therefore college was free, uh, practically free. You know, some, anybody here from New York? Right, so you, the CUNY system was, was free until in, into my lifetime, right? Uh, and then we decided that it, 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 it didn't make a lot of uh, since we wanted to have a, you know, some economic, what did you say, Nina? Okay, sorry. Uh, my friend, and, and, and produce Nina. See, Nina is here from the, uh, <laughs> the part of your team who came through that system. So a lot of good people can, can make that claim. Um, but uh, we backed away from the public commitment. And there's only, really only two ways to pay for, three ways to pay for school, debt, the individual family, and the taxpayer. And as the you know, families aren't making a ton more money. As the taxpayer backs away, what happens is that debt gets bigger and bigger. So now, um, we've got to take a look at this as a country. And I don't think either the right or the left has all the answers on this. But I will tell you something that's shocking. This month, what's, what's the date of it, Natalie? April the 20th? April 25th, this month, um, there's going to be, we're going to hit this historic marker of shame a trillion dollars of student debt in the U.S. economy. A trillion dollars. You say, well, this is a rich country. Maybe a trillion dollars dumped onto this next generation is not that much money. Let me give you a sense of how much money that is. That's more than the, all of the credit card debt in America combined. Take all, wander around, take everybody's credit card out in the whole country, pile it up. It's a smaller pile of debt than just what we have right now in student debt. 
So that's bad. I don't want to get too technical. <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> and so uh, uh, we've got to, there's something wrong. And I'm sure that there's, there's, there's plenty of blame to go around. But the thing about young people, and I see some people in here who, who look like you might be young. The thing about young people is when you have a system like an education system that goes haywire, you know, you think, well, we'll, we'll get around and fix it in 10 years. You know what happens in 10 years? In 10 years, those people who were 15 are 25. People who were 10 are 12. That's a long time. And so you know, we can't, from my point of view, this should be a national emergency. When you have young people graduating off a cliff every spring, graduation used to be happy. Remember that? People would graduate, they would be happy. <laughs> now they graduate and they look like, you know, panic stricken because they got the debt and no job. And so um, one thing that we're doing, and uh, you know, we're getting broadcast everywhere, so I want to make sure I, I mention this. One thing that we should do is make sure we don't make the problem worse. And we're about to. July 1st, Remember this date, July 1st, if Congress does nothing, which they tend to do, the interest rate on the student loans was, is going to, uh, the Stafford student loans is going to double from 3.4% to 6.8%. Now, think about this. This is a big deal. First of all, what are the Stafford student loans? Those are the loans that the smart low-income kids get, right? You're smart enough and supported enough to get into college, but you can't afford it. You go get a Stafford subsidized student loan. The banks right now are getting their money for about free, right? about free. And the most needy, promising young people in America are going to have to pay 6.8% to get their money, to go to college. That, just that delta will represent for the 8 million of them that are likely to be impacted, $20 billion sucked out of their pockets. They don't have a nickel to spare, $20 billion. That's the kind of stuff that Congress could fix uh, by July 1st. We're pushing them to do so. If you care about that, rebuildthedream.com is where we are gathering our forces to fight back. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, you talk about the difference between leadership in presidential office and a social movement. And I guess it's, it's really not a coincidence that in many administrations, there, you know, the social movement is in, rises in opposition to whoever's in power. So you know, we're lucky when there's, well, from a progressive point of view, you might say that this was an opportunity here with Obama in power, and then um, kind of the first time since he was in power for the people to show that they were passionate about something in the Occupy movement, but seemed to have fizzled. So. Um, first, I, like, what, what's your take on how is it possible to a, get those to both ha occur at the same time? It seems like it's been, they're always like, it's like a seesaw. Um, and why didn't it go anywhere, you know, or maybe it still has a chance um, with the Occupy movement? You know, um, this, that's a great, what's your name? Raquel. Raquel, great question. This is a question that was driving me nuts when I wrote the book. So the book attempts to try to answer this. Um, she mentioned Occupy Wall Street. Um, you notice it wasn't called Occupy Silicon Valley? No, I'm serious, you notice that? They said, this is a class warfare movement. These young people are just jealous and they hate rich people and they should be ashamed of themselves. You remember this? There's this TV station that's named after a sneaky furry animal that uh, you may have heard of. Anyway, they talk like that. And so, uh, so, but it wasn't true. I mean, if they were just mad at people who had money, they'd have been out here after you guys, right? Uh, they'd been Occupy Silicon Valley or Occupy Google or something. Occup that was, it wasn't. It was Occupy Wall Street. Why? Just to make sure to make, be clear about the values of the people that we're talking about. Let's talk about what happened. People in America aren't mad at economic winners. People in America admire economic winners. People in America hate economic cheaters. The cheaters. There's a difference. See, there's a difference. There's a sense that you got some people who have rigged the rules, rigged the game for themselves. So no matter how hard some of us work, we can't really succeed. And no matter how badly they perform, they can't fail, because they're already too big to fail. And, but our dreams aren't, and our neighborhoods aren't, and our schools aren't, and our kids aren't. There's something wrong with that. That just seems, that just it makes people angry. And so 
you saw finally this young generation go out there, and struggling folks, but led by young people, and they went to the scene of the crime against their future, Wall Street. They said, listen, we didn't wreck this economy. You guys wrecked the economy, but we don't have any jobs, and our parents can't even get a break from you guys on their mortgages, and we're getting charged up the wazoo every time we use our ATMs, and you guys suck, and we're mad, right? Now, this may not seem very sophisticated, but I tell you, it totally had a positive impact, not on necessarily Wall Street, but on Washington, D.C. Because before they started talking, the only discussion in D.C. was government's a problem, the deficit's a problem, how much are we going to cut out of the programs for ordinary people? Now, if you're a progressive Democrat like myself, you say, wait a minute, if the deficit is a problem, why are we cutting stuff out of people's programs. We didn't, in case you guys missed a couple episodes, we didn't go broke because we helped grandma too much, right? It's like, you know, this is, this is not true. You know, uh, uh, Clinton and Gore administration was over, huge surplus, and we just gave it all away to grandma on Medicare. <laughs> Greedy old grandma. Wait a minute. That's not what happened. <laughs> We, it, Bush tax cuts and Bush wars. You know, God bless him, but Bush tax cuts and Bush wars. So if you want to fix a deficit, you should probably do something about Bush tax cuts and Bush wars. Why are you messing with grandma? Right? That you can have that conversation in D.C. These young people went out there. They started their protest. And it, opened, it proved that grassroots movements matter. And it opened up a whole new conversation. Now, here's a problem. Changing the conversation is not enough. You got to change the conditions for people. Frankly, changing the composition of government is not enough. You ask me how, how I know. We changed it from Republican to Democrat and then Democrat, and the conditions haven't changed. So just changing the conversation or just changing the composition of government is not enough. You got to be able to change the conditions. In order to do that, you got to at some point be able to move from anger to answers. And that's what we were not able to get done in the fall. How do we go from uh, confrontation? How do you balance that with some inspiration, aspiration, clarity about your goals? How do you take some of that protest energy and turn it into electoral power so you can change the conditions? That is the big question. The, I wrote a book about the answers, which are freely available to each and all. <laughs> Rebuild the dream uh, is the name of the book. So, uh, but the, but the basic point I want to make about the, what I think is, is, is possible going forward is simply this. I think if you reelect this president, he gets a chance to do, have another run at it. But we also are different now. The vote and hope strategy is over. <laughs> uh, we're not going to vote and hope. Uh, some of the young occupiers say they don't want to, they don't believe in the electoral system at all anymore because they're so disappointed with Obama. And they say they just don't believe in voting at all. Um, and I tell them, this, listen, man, you know, if anybody has a right to be disappointed or frustrated with the Obama moment, <laughs> I might qualify. <laughs> so, uh, but I know something about elections. You cannot get everything you want in that voting booth. But if you don't vote, you can lose everything you got <laughs> in the voting booth. You can't get everything you want out of voting, but if you don't vote, you can lose everything you've got out of not voting. So it's, it's, it's messy. So you've got to vote and do something else. So my view is we have a, a shot. The, the, even though the occupations are over and Occupy Wall Street itself isn't getting as much attention, the themes they made popular are just as popular. The concern about this economic inequality the concern that the people who've done well in America don't want to do well by America and pay their taxes without complaining about it. The, the, the idea that you have this generation that's falling behind, the idea that Wall Street got bailed out, Main Street got, got left out, though, that is just as salient today as it was when people were out there in those tents. And I think it's up to us to figure out then how we get Fannie and Freddie, for instance, who have half of America's mortgages, to just cut the principal. Just reevaluate the houses fair. Let America's families pay those mortgages back fair. You know what that would be? That would be $90 billion back in the pockets of ordinary people and a million jobs created. You know why? Because if you got a house that's underwater, you're not going to buy a sofa. You're not remodeling. 
you know, you're not, you're not creating local economic activity. All your money is getting sucked out to Fannie and Freddie and the Wall Street banks. Stop it. Stop it. Reevaluate those houses fair and give American families a chance to get back on our feet so we can start. That's a million jobs, $90 billion safe. You know who could do that tomorrow? One guy named Ed DeMarco. He works for President Obama. He could do it tomorrow. But we don't have a movement that's making that demand salient yet. And so now, if you take, if you don't have President Obama there, maybe you have somebody else that I would like less, the movement you've got to have to get that victory might have to be 10 times bigger. So it's pretty smart to try to win in, no, win in November. I try, try to tell the, the younger people, try to win in November politically so we can win December, January, February, March, April economically. It is possible. It's not the, nor the normal thing, but these are not normal times. Thank you. So just along those same lines, um, in terms of an effort to try and align the aspirations of m a movement and the willingness of a uh, federal political leader, what's the role of the private sector in that effort? And then if you have specific ideas on what um, our company can do um, to try and work towards that as an organization and not just as individuals. Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, the, the private sector is going to be the main engine in the recovery, and it's trying to be. The problem that we have right now is that the best people, the best new companies, the best new ideas um, right now, I think, have a big problem. I'm a, a green guy, clean energy person. I know how many great ideas there are out there on the clean and green side of our economy. I know how many entrepreneurs are out there, how many products are out there. And I also know that both political parties, McCain and Obama, said when they were running in 2008, climate change is real. Both of them said that. Both of them said that we've got to have a cap and trade system to deal with it. Both of them said that. And both of them said it would create more jobs. Because they were both right. I mean, if you don't believe me, f go on YouTube and find the clip where McCain turns to Obama and says, climate change is a hoax. You'll never find it. Find the ad where McCain says, global warming is a hoax. Or cap and trade is socialism. Or clean energy will destroy American jobs. Doesn't happen. Why? Because at that moment, both parties had faced reality, and they were actually competing with each other who was going to have the best energy solutions for America. Um, so we failed to take advantage of that bipartisan moment. Uh, I think, frankly, the other side has a lot of responsibility for that. But what did that mean for us? Talk about the, our, our private sector here in the US. It meant that the $80 billion the president put on the table in the stimulus package for green solutions was then swamped by what our friends in China did. We had a moment, put those dollars on the table with the stimulus bill, and then pass cap and trade. How do, you how do you get the private sector unleashed on some of these problems, creating more jobs, better technologies? You get the public investments right, did that. $80 billion in stimulus package for green and clean solutions. At that time, the biggest investment in clean energy in the history of the world. At that point, Obama was not the black president. He was the green president, OK? <laughs> That's where he was in February of 2009. Big public investment, but that's still puny, 70 billion, 80 billion dollars, still puny compared to what the private sector could do. So you gotta get the public investment right, and then you get the public rules right, cap and trade, to get the private sector to come in and play. That was, it, and we were set up to do it. And then it just became politically better to call it socialism and say that Obama's trying to take over the energy system and score political points in the short term, and we drop the ball. So then what do you have? You have American new energy companies and entrepreneurs out there, standing out there, now naked with no help from, the, from the, a change of rules. And our good friends in China say, Phew. we almost got outflanked by the Americans. And they went triple down on clean energy and are now wiping out American solar companies by flooding the world with cheap solar. Short term, that's great, cheap solar for me and you. Long term, that means you lose all your American industry. You go from importing dirty energy from the Middle East to importing clean energy technology from Asia, and you skip all the jobs in the middle. 
And, the, and who's responsible for that? People call themselves patriots. Here's my problem with it. Now listen, you take a company like a Solyndra, and everybody uses that to just beat the crap out of the president. But what they don't talk about is that the Solyndra benefited from a George W. Bush loan program. That loan program was George Bush's loan program. $2.4 billion loan program that had a 99% success rate except for Solyndra. Why did it get knocked down? Because that $2.4 billion loan program was going up against a $30 billion grant program in China to knock it out. But rather than us talking about how we protect the next round of innovation in our own country, we're doing food fight politics in Washington, D.C. Now, my view is that we're, I'm all for the, the private sector, but the private sector has to work according to rules. And the rules right now are nutty. The rules right now don't let innovators innovate, especially in our, in our energy sector, and that's got to change. Now, you talk about a company like Google and some of the things that Google can do as a company. Um, you know, it's very hard, I think, for you guys to understand how important you have become to the world. Um, I mean, you guys look like normal people. I was expecting, you know, <laughs> wings, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that you guys come kind of gliding in, you know, on some, <laughs> come out of some chrysalis, you know. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. So, um, you know, I honestly haven't thought all the way, I was just happy to meet you guys. I haven't thought all the way through um, uh, 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 what's possible. But I'll tell you what the, where the needs are. First of all, uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to create enough jobs in the short term to take a real bite out of the pain for this next generation. And I think we've got, we need your help to, think, to, to be honest about this. If the big fact on the world stage is Asian middle classes are going to get bigger, which is a good thing, especially if they can grow green, that's a great thing. Pull people out of poverty and do it in a green way, that's a, that'll be a a huge achievement for this new century. But if Asian middle classes are going to get bigger, it's a good thing, you may have Western middle classes getting smaller at the same time while that gets sorted out. If that's going to be an undeniable fact, then that gap, what we do with that gap, determines what kind of country we are. Now, that gap will be, will be filled up by something that we would now call an informal set of economies. There are only two kinds, though. There's negative informal economies. That's also known as drugs, <laughs> gangs, <laughs> st stealing stuff, right? And then there's positive informal economies. And I think there's an opportunity here for the tech sector to really partner with the people on this. We could become a nation of neighbors and share, it sounds crazy to you. But there's this new movement happening. It's this shareable economy. It's this thing called shareable.net. I'm fascinated with it. it. Maybe we can't get our income level up, 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 up. Maybe our, some income levels may even come down a little bit. But what if our quality of life went up because we used our social capital to help each other? Is there some way for us to use our social capital to begin to help each other? Now, the thing about this is we already have a bunch of stuff in America. I mean, we're still the richest country in the world, richest country in the history of the world. Got a lot of stuff here. But we tend to hoard it. I want to figure out some way for us to unlock the wealth we already have and use it better. You guys will have much smarter answers about that than I do. But I have some insight, because I'm a dad. And I know about sharing, because I have two boys <laughs> who never want to share. <laughs> Here's the cool thing about sharing, and then I'll, we'll, we'll, pro we'll probably be out of time. Sharing can either be really cool or really uncool. If you have to share, if you're forced to share, sharing sucks. But if you get to share, sharing's great. It's called making friends. Right? So think about that. If you, is there some way for us to make sharing easy and cool? Right? Uh, if, you, if you're sharing, if you're forced to share, 
because the system screwed you. That sucks, right? The system screwed me. Now I'm on my mom's couch. I have to share this couch with my cousin who's also screwed. This sucks, right? If you're sharing because the system screwed you, but if you're sharing because you're saying screw the system, that's cool. If you're opting out of some of the rampant materialism and that kind of thing, and you're opting into a community of people who just share their tools and share their cars, I mean, you got Zipcar, you got um, Kiva, you got Kickstarter. There's something beginning to happen in technology supporting this idea that we could maybe do better with the stuff that we've got instead of always trying to get more and more of it. That won't, in America, displace the whole economy. Probably shouldn't. But it could sure make life a lot better. And I would love to figure out some way to be in communication and conversation with people here. Uh, the stuff you guys do on a regular basis, if it could be, if we could help people not fall so far. Just don't let people fall so far. Can we help each other? H hang on to each other so we don't fall so far. When people fall real far, they get, mad, they get angry. They do things that are scary. Uh, people start to fall and somebody catches them. That's a good thing. You got another time for one yeah. more question? One more question. Thanks. Um, a okay, couple thanks. weeks ago, Obama was in Oklahoma, and it was about the XL pipeline. Yeah. And I'm curious to know what your sense is on juggling environmental and economic development issues in the country. So yeah. looking at that and also the, the shale and the, um, the fracking, fracking yeah, in yeah. Pennsylvania and the, that debate. Thanks. Well, a couple things. Um, the problem with fracking is that it's short term smart, long-term, mid-term, unknowable, possibly not smart, and long-term, stupid, OK? And we don't do that well with those kind of problems, right? Short-term, it's pretty smart. Why? Because it sure would be great <laughs> to be able to get methane out of the ground if it's there um, and use it uh, to keep energy prices down. Mid-term kind of questionable because nice to have cheap energy, bad to have kids with cancer because the water is poison, right? So is, can, they, they won't tell us what's in there, which makes me assume it's not a sugar pop. Right? And they're like, we're doing this fracking with Kool-Aid, right? <laughs> They'd probably let us know. <laughs> But if they won't let us know, it makes me think that maybe it's not Kool-Aid. Maybe it's something I don't want in my kids' water. So midterm is unknowable, but kind of scary. You know, fracking, they're forcing this chemical down and breaking up the rocks and getting more methane out. They call it natural gas. You know, natural gas comes from Chile. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's methane. Let's call it what it is. Um, so, uh, but long term. You got my joke. Thank you. <laughs> Not the country. Yeah, the, you, yeah. We'll talk later. So, but long term is kind of foolish because it's still carbon based. It's still taking dead stuff, burning it, and putting it up into the atmosphere that already has too much carbon. And so, and it's doing so in a way that's disrupting the short-term markets for wind and big solar. So now, we're again, we're just about to make the leap into big wind projects and big solar projects, which will, you know, the, the price is just about to work out for that. And then you've got something that's going to be there for a long time that won't cook the planet. And then, eh, never mind, let's just get, do, let's, you know, it's like, oh, you know, it's like going from, you know, one bad drug to an even cheaper, easier to get drug. It's just bad. It's bad. So I'm not a big fan of that stuff. I think it's taking, our, taking us away from the right direction. And then the whole Keystone Pipeline thing has really, it just makes me sad. Because this, the, 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 the food fight politics in Washington, D.C. is increasingly 
pushing us to do things that just are actually bad for the country. People say we should have the pipeline because it will create jobs. That's just not it's true. Uh, we will create some jobs uh, if, we do, if we do this thing. Um, it's about 1,000 temporary jobs. Now, if, they, if you count where like every piece of metal that's used, if you count the people, like I mean, you can you can do anything with job numbers. Like a million people worked on this, you know, because like you know somebody was like at the toll booth when the thing drove by, <laughs> they, that counts as a job. I mean, you know, you can you can count, but if you actually look at the actual number of jobs here, you're talking about a thousand, two thousand temporary jobs. Those are important jobs for people who have them, and we want them because a lot of job whoever built this was a temporary job. So I'm not saying that temporary jobs are bad. But I'm just saying, let's just be clear, we're talking about a small handful of temporary jobs. Um, and frankly, if we're going to do temporary jobs, we may as well do that building wind turbines and every other stuff. If you, that's, that's, that's all, if, if, if the only thing you can imagine for your temporary jobs is to like, come up with a toxic pipeline through America, then I'd challenge your imaginational capacities. Uh, you probably can't work here if you think that way. So, so I think that's uh, bad. Uh, the, the permanent jobs are about 100 permanent jobs, but what people don't get they say, this is going to be good for gas prices in America. I mean, this is gas. This, this is, the first of all, the dirtiest, most toxic, worst stuff on the planet Earth. You're now scraping the bottom of the barrel for the last of the polycarbons. That's what tar sands are, the last of the polycarbons, the most toxic, worst fuel. And then it comes all the way through America down that pipeline, across our aquifers, over our farmland, to be refined in Louisiana and shipped to China. It's not even for <laughs> the US to use it. It's going to be refined and sent, sent to China. So now, I don't want the people in China using this stuff, but here's what I know about tar sand oil. It's the most corrosive. It's the most corrosive. They've already had so many spills up in Canada already. It's the most corrosive. Now, you saw the oil spill we had down there with the BP oil spill. Imagine if that is American farmland and aquifers. You could, you could knock out huge, I mean, it's, why? For a couple thousand temporary jobs, and frankly, I'd rather than be building wind turbines, and for a couple hundred permanent jobs, and so China can have dirty oil processed here. That doesn't make sense. And, and, and listen to me. If we were having a normal conversation with normal people on either side of the political divide, we, it wouldn't even be on the table. We'd say it's just not worth the risk. But it's good politics. It's good point scoring. It's good to make your, your bigger point about the president being out of touch, even if it hurt America. So, you know, I think that, you know, people who are in your situation, uh, I mean, you guys, uh, I mean, I'm sure you got. I don't know, jobs or something here, but <laughs> stuff you got to do. But what we have seen, in, oh, this is in closing now, we've seen young people who don't know a lot about politics and new people in the technology field who don't know a lot about politics have tremendous impact on the political system. We have a young woman on our staff named Molly Catchpole. Young woman, 22 years old, uh, she happened to, before she was on our staff, happened to find out that Bank of America was going to start charging her five extra bucks a month to use her debit card. And she said, I don't have five extra bucks a month to give the biggest bank <laughs> that we've got. It's not fair. So she put up a, 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 a petition on change.org, which went viral. And Bank of America, faced with either having to deal with Molly Catchpole <laughs> and her viral petition, or have billions of dollars for itself, <laughs> said, never mind. Never mind. Same young woman, Verizon, said they were going to charge five extra bucks to use her phone. She said, I don't have five extra bucks. She put a petition up on change.org. They found out that Molly put the petition up. And within 48 hours, they said, never mind. We quit. <laughs> Why should we have you know, dollars? Right. Leave us alone. Right. 
Well, now she's on our staff, and she's uh, helping to run this uh, uh, student loan campaign. Uh, if I were Sally May, I'd just surrender now, you know? <laughs> um, but she wrote from her heart about it. And she used some tools that were available, and she made a huge difference. And I think about somebody like, like Molly, and you probably, you know, some of you guys probably you even know her or whatever, you're all about the same age. Don't underestimate what you can get done. You know, you're so privileged. And I don't mean that, like, you know, if you guys went to college, like, privilege is bad. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm privileged. No, it's like, it turns, most people, like, the word privilege is a good thing. You've been gifted, you've been blessed, you have the opportunity to think about problems in completely different ways, uh, to see trends way before everybody else, and start pre-adapting, and to help people. And everybody who uses your product is out there right now, I'll tell you what they're Googling, if they're Googling anything, uh, you know, debt forgiveness, uh, clinical depression, Education, home mortgage. I mean, look at what people are looking up right now. People are hurting. I would love for us to live in a country where we're as good to our grandkids as our grandparents were to us. You look at what our grandparents went through to give us this country. They didn't say every kid for themselves. They said, we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna create the best country in the world for our kids to, to prosper in. And they weren't a lot older than, than us when they made those decisions. And so now we are in that same situation. And we have the responsibility to give our kids as good a country as we got. And I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you very much.